Welcome and thank you for joining the HKU Virtual Information Day for Undergraduate Admissions. I'm Ryan, I'm your host today, and I'm a year two medical student here at HKU. So for this session, the talk will be divided into two parts. So first we'll focus on the latest programs offered by HKU in the upcoming academic year. And then we'll talk about the admissions requirements and also the criteria. So um, last but not least, we'll have a Q&A session to address your questions. So um, you may have questions as we go on. So please send in your questions via the Q&A function in the webinar so that we can answer them um, in the Q&A session at last. So without further ado, let's begin. So please welcome our speakers today. First, we have our Director of Undergraduate Admissions at HKU, Professor Bennett Yim. We have Mr. Mr. Fred Xiu, National Technology Officer at Microsoft Hong Kong. We have Mr. Brian Wang, Director, Marketing Science at Facebook Greater China. And as well as Dr. Deng Chao, Program Director of the Bachelor of Business Administration, Business Analytics at HKU to share with us the important trend and application of big data, as long with the distinguishing features of the latest programs offered by HKU. So please join me to welcome these speakers. So now I'll pass the time to Professor Yim and the rest of the guest speakers. Okay, uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Hong Kong U is constantly revising and enhancing our undergraduate curriculum so that we can keep them up to date because uh, we want to train up outstanding leaders for Hong Kong, China, and the world uh, to meet the rapidly changing development in the society. This year, uh, we are rolling out a total of seven brand new undergraduate programs. Five of them are related to big data uh, or the digital economy or technology. Uh, well, I think you agree with me that uh, big data and the digitization are the biggest current and future trend. They're also the major direction of our economic development. And because of that, the demand for talent in this area will probably continue to grow. Uh, we believe our new program will allow uh, students with different goals, uh, interests, and capability to find what is best for them in preparing them to explore and realize the ample opportunities uh, in the increasingly digitized world. Well, uh, as Ryan just uh, introduced our speaker, and we are certainly very delighted to have Fred and also Brian with us today. Uh, they are experienced leaders in multinational corporation, and they are the experts certainly in the use of big data. And they will share with us their valuable insight uh, on big data application, demand for talents, etc. And certainly my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Deng, will be telling us more about uh, the program that he'll be leading. Uh, now, uh, uh, guess, uh, now, this day, we often hear about the terms like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, uh, data science, uh, machine learning. Uh, but I'm not sure like many people can really tell how these different things, uh, how these different uh, terminology actually are different, and particularly like, how are they related to each other. So maybe uh, if I can suggest, like, maybe we'll, we'll ask you to uh, help us to define some of those terms, maybe also tell us like, how are they different or how are they related. Uh, I don't know whether Fred or, or <laughs> Brad want to take the first shot. Yeah, oh, sure. I mean, uh, uh, AI, I think if you go to uh, do search, you can actually find, I mean, a dozen of different definitions. I think, in, in a nutshell, I think our, my definition of AI is really like a, is a, is a, is a computer that can kind of like uh, imitate a human like uh, interactions. Um, through some sort of like a, a technology such as the cognitive surface and so on. So it's just like a machine can really mimic what a human can do. Like, and, and uh, can actually analyze the image, um, can really compare a speech, or even inter inter interact with another human being um, and, and eventually predict a result through some data and that take. And I would say our machine learning could be a subset of AI. And also um, deep learning, as you heard a lot of like a new networking, is then a subset of machine learning. So that, that's really a high level of definition, if you like, from my, my point of view. OK, thank you, Fred. Uh, Brian? <laughs> I think Fred made a very good definition from a technology point of view. And let me give you some practice. I experienced something, uh, no matter to talk about machine learning, AI, or big data. So uh, what's the difference between big data versus small data? What's the difference between uh, AI, artificial intelligence versus human intelligence? What's the difference between uh, machine learning versus human learning? The key difference on big data, what I observed, is structured and unstructured. In small data, we come with very, very logical. We know what data looks like. However, when you go into the future, today or future, a lot of data was just scattering there. 
it's, it's not structured for, you, for your, your own purpose. You have to figure out a way to deal with that. And the second, on the AI, obviously, is something artificial, right? It's not a human. It has strengths. It also has downsides. When you watch how strength is computing much faster than human. Downsides, it still cannot self-learn, it's below. So when you watch how it's a bit there. And machine learning, similarly, machine learning is the upside is learning much faster, learning from mistakes, repeat it, can repeat the learning cycle, let's say, in milliseconds. Well, a human need to learn in days. That's the upside of it. But they still need a lot of guidance from human to set the right rule, set the right goal, so it can operate as a train. So this is my some practical experience when, when we deal with those data. Okay. A lot of methodology. Yeah, uh, maybe don't think yeah, I would like to also <laughs> add from the academic perspective view, because we are designing this data program. So basically, for, my, for myself, I think that the root of analytics is data. But it's not just individual data, like one person's income, transactions, or travel logs. We're talking about a collective behaviors and activities of a group of people, which we call big data. So with this vast amount of data, what we can do is a lot of opportunities. We can try to explore some relationship from it. We can try to dig out some pattern. We can try to use it to predict for future happenings. We can also use it to learn some strategies and so on. So that's uh, really easy to, 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 to say all that. But actually to do them, we need to have different methodologies. Okay? So knowing that, what we know about AI, you can think of AI as a toolbox. Inside this toolbox, you can find a lot of methodologies, such as machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, recommendation systems, cluster analysis, uh, and so on. You name it, there's a lot of it. So each of these serves a particular purpose, depending on what data you have and depending on what objective you have in mind. Okay? So, so don't get uh, intimidated by these fancy terms. <laughs> They're just different types of uh, data methodologies. Uh, but also, of course, do not get too fascinated <laughs> with these terms. The, uh, the truth is, they can be challenging at some times. So that's my personal understanding of all those different terms. OK. Well, thank you. Thank you very much right, uh, for all the kind of like experts' like opinion at the same time helping us to get an easier understanding of all these difficult terms. And my, my kind of like, if I can conclude, uh, seems like it's, it's like the, the good old day, like input plus tool, get out the output. But this time the input is uh, much different from what we, we used to. And so Fred, it's kind of like, uh, remind us that, I mean, big data is not just limited to quantitative data or, or numbers. We can also talking about like, uh, I mean, visuals or other kind of like, and then Brian mentioned like, they are, a lot of them are unstructured, right? I mean, I think that make a big difference. And then Dollar Ding mentioned the important part also is the tool, the me method. If you don't have the good tool, then garbage in, garbage out. So, <laughs> so I think those are really, really good like insight. Uh, uh, I'm sure like our audience probably also uh, want to know more about like, well, how are those like uh, method, the, the big data, I mean the data, the method, how are they being applied this day? Can, can we get some examples of like in a different industry, different field, how they actually are being used? Yeah, it's just a lot, right? Uh, let's talk about Hong Kong, right? I, I, I know I'm, a lot of audience not really local, but we do have like what we call a smart city uh, strategy in Hong Kong. Uh, the government just published uh, some strategy and um, last year, I think, um, I think through the strategy, we've had 160-something initiatives. If you look at all these smart cities, uh, I would say uh, projects that uh, our government is implementing, I think almost 80 to 90% of them actually deal with big, big, big data, AI, cloud computing. This kind of technology is really infusing uh, any smart city development. So, for example, uh, smart city like today, um, if you actually go out uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, get my, um, my, I would say, ID card, right? Um, the entire what we call electronic ID application in Hong Kong is actually using a lot of AI. Uh, for example, we can actually scan my ID without really having me to type in my ID card. Okay, read my face as my ID identifications using face recognition technology, this kind of thing. So all of them actually uh, are infused into that uh, project. So smart city application like uh, education, healthcare, uh, constructions, all these smart building, they actually use a lot of data and AI technology to, to really enable that. So it's a tons of example around this area. I can also give some real example. Uh, we, are, we are working with some uh, local government to provide humanity help. So uh, 
when the, the volcano erupt in the sand island, uh, uh, the island of Saint Vincent. Uh -huh. So a lot, we observe a lot of people moving from own home to some of the remote area, like uh, along the other side of the island. And then the government has a problem: how to provide the correct number and quality of shelters to provide immediate support. In all the ways, you have to make the phone call one by one at tight times. But we are partnered with government relief efforts to try to use our public identity map. And we can identify where is the most condensed population that need help, and where that might be less. So to help the government to allocate the, the, the right amount of shelter service to help those people in difficulty to come with difficult period. I think this is a pretty tangible. And then because of the data, the government can react much faster, much, much faster. Yes so than before. I think this is uh, also a pretty interesting example we have seen in practice. <laughs> Actually, I do also want to add a few. This is something I personally teach in my course, <laughs> but given different examples of how big data can add value yeah. to business. Uh, for example, as a retailer, we can use uh, data to help them better recommend products to, to consumers, so they're more likely to purchase. For banks, they can streamline their application of loans or credit cards. You know, for for logistics companies, they can better plan their shipment. And also want to give one example from the perspective, perspective of education, because mm -hmm. we are a university. Uh, so for university, think about you know every year we have this admission cycle running for <laughs> month. And for universities, for us, we really have to explore, deploy a lot of resources to get the message to the right parents and children, uh, to their children. And for them, for the students and parents, they also have to spend a lot of effort researching what's the right program, what's the right university. And think about it, it goes on month, every year. So if we can have a program which can help the parents uh, and the students accurately predict or, uh, uh, what uh, the, 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 the best major will be for them with likelihood of being admitted to that program, wouldn't that be nice <laughs> and cool? And for university, when they apply, if we can give them immediate decision, admit or not admit, based on their, say, qualifications, uh, uh, background, uh, past experiences, and so on, wouldn't that also be much more efficient? Well, the application not, does not stop there. It, it's, it's endless in every aspect. So that is why big data or data-related jobs are so uh, in, in increasing demand in these days. I certainly know like, uh, who I need to go to next year when we have to, uh, <laughs> to enhance our admission process. Like, yeah. uh, I mean, the students have a difficulty predicting whether we admit them. Same way for us, like, we have a difficulty predicting who will show up. So, exactly. so I, I know like, next year definitely will go to you <laughs> and get some yeah. help on that. Well, Professor Yama, I'd like to make one more example because sure. uh, it's related to Hong Kong University. Yeah. That's why I just remember. <laughs> I think about uh, last year a, year, a year and a half ago, one of your teams in the uh, University of Hong Kong uh, from your startup um, uh, community, Idrandon, they actually submit a project to Microsoft. Uh, we call is a competition uh, called Imagine Cup. Actually, they, they won the worldwide uh, top oh, prize. Okay. And, and the project, what they did is is a, is a mental companion uh, apps that actually help people to actually uh, settle their mental, uh, I will say, uh, illness, if you like. So it's like a chatbot. It can actually uh, talk to the, the mobile apps and collect some data from you and advise what you need to do to, to actually kind of like uh, uh, kill your mental uh, illness if you have, a, uh, have an opportunity with that. So it's really interesting uh, uh, technology. They actually do use a lot of big data, AI, machine learning, natural language processing kind of technology to actually put into the project. And they got the what? They got the world wow. grand prize. Wow. <laughs> a lot of money too, right? Wow. That's, so that's great. Yeah, yeah. I, I think allow me maybe to do a insert a, an advertising for yeah, uh, iDendrum. So. Yeah, uh, this is actually a uh, lab that that we have at Hong Kong U that help our students who have this like great idea to how to kind of turn it into a, not just an idea but actually a project. And then um, eventually, hopefully, we'll get some funding to further develop. Yeah. yeah so, uh, well, that, that's very very exciting. And and certainly. Like, Listening to all that, like I mean, if I'm a student, I really want to get into this like uh, field. But then, of course, like the parents and the student, oftentimes will have this question: Well, uh, eventually, I need to look for a job. So, what was the uh, job or career prospect of, of all these like big data related like kind of uh, study? If I graduate from some of this program, like uh, I mean, would I guarantee a job? Or so, what's the situation right now in Hong Kong as well as like overseas? So, what's the demand like look like? 
Yeah, so uh, maybe I can share some yeah. perspective. Given I'm lucky uh, in the past few years, able to get a chance to touch with thousands of uh, and, uh, clients from different industries. Let me share some of the observations. Of course, I mean, since students from Hong Kong, you don't have to worry about the job, right? <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> but more like uh, how, how do you think, uh, what, how you can perform best in your future job? The, one, the first observation is that uh, it's also partly driven by COVID. The digital transformation is an unstoppable trend. It covers the first, the traditional uh, uh, industry, like let's put it this way, if you are a retailer, mm -hmm. right? If you are selling some of the food, the packaged food to the, to the local communities, they are forced to how to get the idea, new product information, even get the product shipped without touching the audience. This is driven by COVID, right? And second, a lot of brands want to listen to a consumer feedback. Previously, they have to you know, bring them in room or bring them counter, talk to them. But nowadays, there's so many digital uh, tools out there. So they collect intact, and sometimes we call it co-create a brand service together with the people out there. So this is obviously the, on, on the other side of the traditional brand, to move into digital device. That doesn't mean that all the, we call it digital native uh, clients, are they doing enough good? Not necessary. So, of course, if you think about someone like us, we are sophisticated, we take granted with data, but also all observed that with fierce and fierce competition, a lot of even digital native clients are relying more and more data driven decisions. Let me put one a tangible example. You know, a lot of the Hong Kong or the greater China region, they're doing business not only for this region. With the digital platform, they're able to do the global business. Mm. But the trend they're facing is, they don't know the consumer out there, what they should offer, how to private service to them, and uh, how to provide relevant content to them. So previously they have to guess, or they have to hire someone from their country and go into the, the office. But nowadays, because of digitalization, they're able to get intact, intact or get insight from a lot of data out there, including data from us, to understand, hey, what's the difference consumer preference from Middle East versus US? So they can design the different product and service and provide the relevant information to the people, to them. So this, I see a, a both end. So in my, my conclusion, the, the, the skill on data will be becoming even more demanding, rather than it's, it's far away from a situation point. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, like, uh, I, I just look at some number. Um, some, I think some study or paper uh, written by uh, World Economic Forum mentioned in about 10 years' time, uh, there's over 77% 77, 77 of job required digital skill or data analytics skill. And 60% 60 of 60% 60, 60 of the job um, will be replaced by automation too, right? So uh, I think uh, in order to really catch up this, like uh, I would say, a knowledge based economy, I think having digital skill or data analytics skill is important. So we just cannot rely on like an engine produced by like double E or computer science, <laughs> I mean department in all the university. Or even all that graduate add up is just not able to fulfill what the market needs. I think having these new programs, they find new programs within Hong Kong in different disciplines, including like business school, uh, medical school, or even uh, liberal arts, right? I think it's, it's tremendous. I mean, um, um, that and the survey actually is before COVID, right? With COVID, I think the digital transformation is accelerating like a much faster and hybrid world, like uh, online shopping, online everything. You need more people with data analytics skill. So, and, and if I think uh, we also have our, uh, one of the companies from Microsoft, LinkedIn, we actually offer what called economic graph data. So every year look at economic graph data. The high demand, we actually look at how many people hire on different and skill set, right? So the most high demand job always in like AI, data scientists, machine learning, cloud computing. And you see the growth is really always on the right, top right hand, right? And the number of people available in the market is not, 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 not enough. Yeah, that, that's all my input. So I think uh, having that skill, uh, we definitely need this kind of like, uh, skill to actually help our economy to grow. Exciting, like, yep. <laughs> yeah. Actually, pretty much uh, covered exactly what I want to say. Uh, I totally agree. Um, the pandemic definitely has accelerated this uh, digitalization. We're seeing more and more services moving online. And just one thing to add, um, I think, and also agree with Ryan, I think this trend is irreversible and will continue to hold even after the pandemic. I think from the university perspective, in the, in the past two years, we have adopted a few measures to counter this uh, pandemic situation. 
we've moved things online. And I think the university is already talking about keeping some of these measures even after the pandemic. So that will, tell, that will basically tell you how important digitalization is in the future. And then because of this trend, irreversible trend, much more data will be generated online. And then definitely there will be increasing demand calling for talents who can handle data, who can uh, generate value from data. So I would believe that demand will always be there and also will be increasing in the foreseeable future. Uh, that's also my personal opinion. Wow, so, so first of all, we have like interesting subject matter, exciting kind of like uh, study, and then we have great like career prospect. And I'm sure the next question some students will be asking is like, I mean, am I qualified? Like, I mean, would, would this kind of wonderful prospect, wonderful future available for everyone or, or are they only available for certain kind of students? So, so I don't know whether our guests can kind of maybe give, us, give the student like some insight on is that particular type of student should fit there or everybody have an opportunity? Yeah. I love to provide <laughs> some insight here. <laughs> give an <laughs> interview uh, hundreds of people in my past few years, so while Facebook is growing, we're trying to recruit the best talent into the, into the company. Uh, besides whatever the experts here is talking about hard skills, one question I want to put on the table is, what is changing, what is not changed? I think if we look at what happened past 10 years, look for future, what going to be changed tooling, methodologies? I believe the industry evolves so fast, Whatever popular three years ago, no longer hold true six, seven years ago, later, right? But what I always something holding true regarding the talent, the qualification, is two things. No matter what method they're using. The first one is the curiosity. Mm. To be transparent, data could be very boring. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you are a person who don't have the curiosity to look into the clouds of data, a lot of boring stuff, figure out something interesting inside, that may be some problem. This is first curiosity. The second is about, about how, to, how you're able to use the inside to influence other people. Mm -hmm. Fred can add more, but in love company, sure. data scientists is not the one of the biggest organization. However, it, the, the, the audience was set up, the data scientists have to be able to influence the key decision makers, CEOs, because they are all smart people. Nowadays, if you look at CEO, 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 they're all smart people. Then how do they make a decision if they have different opinions based on data? So we have, I have interviewed many talent who has great skill of data modeling, data mining, but some of them is not able to or don't have the passion to translate them into a audience-friendly influence, influence message or someone can be. So think about it. Someday, if you are a top data science company, you're sitting beside a CEO and driving some directions. You have two choices. One thing, bring every model uh, from SS put on table, CEO read this. Mm. All this is in three sentences, you tell what you find, the key insight, and ask, recommend CEO what direction. So you can very easily judge which one is working better to achieve what's your own value. Your own value is not data itself. You only how to bring data things out of data and drive actions. Yeah. So this is top two learning what I learned yeah. in my past, my personal experience and my interview experience. Wow. Good insight, good insight. Yeah, I, I think um, data analytics skill has become, <laughs> I would say, a fundamental <laughs> skill now, right? So in order for anybody to perform in any job, you definitely need some sort of like data and analytics skills. And these type of skills uh, normally come from your, the way you actually deal with some documents, some data. Even you're really smart in spreadsheet, right? You play around with spreadsheet. And now all these tools from not, not just Microsoft or anybody, when they offer tools, there's a lot of data analytics built in or plug in. So uh, it's, it's a matter how we can, you're able to use this kind of like plug in or tools already uh, available for you. So if I look at our organization, or any organization, the top performer, um, most of the time are those who really understand how to analyze data, uh, especially the management, right? Uh, our, like uh, our CFO have to look at data all the time. Uh, she or he has to understand uh, where the data come from, where the data is real or not real, and also all the data culture. Even our legal people, they have to look at the data. So now, if you a lot of data, when uh, uh, Dr. Dane talked about um, this, um, the, the veracity and the, a, vo a volume of data, so a lot of data become very sensitive data. Yeah. How, how you actually deal with this sensitive data? How you deal with this person, per, uh, personal data? It requires a lot of skill in 
almost any discipline. You're a lawyer, you're an accountant, you're a management, you're a CEO. You have to understand uh, where the data come from, how to manage the data, and how to deal with the data. So it's become, uh, I would say, uh, anybody need to understand that, right? <laughs> Yeah, actually, I also agree. Um, well, basically, uh, there is some definition of data analytics. As Brian has just mentioned, it's about turning data into insights and then yes. use that insights to help businesses make better decisions. So, so that means data analytics is not for everyone. If you're not <laughs> interested, if you do not have a curiosity sure. in data analytics and obtaining insights. So depending on the nature of job or depending on the specific domain, uh, the qualifications or qualities required may be different. That is why for, for us, we're offering five <laughs> <laughs> different programs. Some, you may find some of one fit your, your needs, right? And, and also, as we mentioned, this demand will always be there. Uh, so it's right now, I think it's a good time to get in this field and then, I, I, I believe if you want to get into one of this program, you should have some shared value. That is, you believe that data is the next big thing. If you have that belief, then one of these data programs will be fit for you. That's my, my suggestion. Well, thank you so much. I, I really want to like, uh, continue our discussion, but I think because of the time limitation, uh, I want to thank like, our speaker for all your sharing. And uh, I think uh, certainly we, I hope everybody get a much better understanding about all these like, terms related to big data. And also, like, if you're excited about the uh, demands like, for talents in the field, and uh, I, I kind of uh, also like, because I, I've been spending some time reading our uh, description of our big data related program, and I feel that like, uh, I mean, all, all our program actually quite relevant to what we have discussed. So uh, allow me maybe uh, now to take up uh, a little bit of time to uh, give a very quick introduction about uh, our five program. And then here, because the daughter thing will be here, so I think when it comes to the specific program that he managed, I'll pass uh, the time to him to uh, talk more about that program. So as you can see, like, uh, basically we have five new programs. The first one is uh, the Bachelor of Engineering in Data Science and, Eng and Engineering. And uh, you can consider this more of kind of the foundation, building uh, the foundation for big data because uh, in this program you'll be learning about uh, construction management of big data and, and also of course like uh, all these different tools that uh, I mean you will need to use to an analyze the big data. And uh, so this program particularly also like uh, training people to enter some of the new and uh, exciting uh, career path or research area uh, in data science and also data engineering such as uh, data engineer, uh, data architect, uh, data scientists, uh, data analysts, uh, machine learning engineer, uh, all kinds of like uh, new job uh, that is available in the market. And interestingly, uh, we I'm going to jump right to the last one on the screen. Uh, it's the Bachelor of Arts because earlier we also I think Fred particularly pointed out uh, it's just the big data like related study. It's not just only for like uh, data oriented student. Uh, in fact, for students who are even in the humanity, if they're interested in uh, culture and arts, there are a lot for them to, to participate in this uh, kind of development of big data and, and digital technology. As we can see like in the uh, arts field, we have the crypto arts this day. We have many of those like, uh, I mean, culture and arts that uh, are moving in the direction, same direction in digitization. And this particular uh, program obviously is trying to combine the talent in both culture, uh, arts, uh, humanity, as well as like the digital technology. So those of the students who are interested in arts, but also want to kind of get a ride on this uh, digitization trend, obviously this will be a program that you should uh, spend some time looking at. And then uh, there, there's also the uh, Bachelor of Science in Bioinformatics. And uh, certainly like uh, this couple of days, I think uh, if you actually pay attention to our talk or advertising or, or even like uh, some of the news press release, uh, this program has received a lot of attention uh, in, in the media, uh, partly because like uh, it's, it's related to medicine, uh, but according to uh, the uh, program director who joined us like previously on talking about this program, is uh, this program the focus is on more statistics. How do you apply big data analysis statistics uh, on biomedical and healthcare data? And everybody know this day like uh, healthcare is a big issue, it's affecting a lot of people in the world. And uh, those uh, big data analysis will obviously help address many of the problems uh, that we are facing. 
Uh, that allow me to maybe also like briefly talk about this uh, uh, Bachelor of Science in Marketing, Analytic and Technology. And in the business school, we have two programs. One is this Marketing, Analytic and Technology. And the other one is the uh, program managed by uh, Dr. Deng, which is focused on business analytic. Uh, both programs obviously will talk about uh, application of big data, uh, all this method, mm -hmm. but the domain seems to be different. Yep. I think uh, in the first one, the focus is more on marketing. So it's probably uh, more suitable for students who already decide uh, marketing is going to be the career they want to explore. While the, for business analytics, maybe uh, you have a general like, uh, management kind of focus. Uh, so I can understand like time is running out, so I'm going to pass it to uh, Dora Ding to share with you mm -hmm. more information about the business analytics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction and also for offering me this opportunity to basically introduce to the audience the program that I'm leading right now. So this Bachelor of Business Administration, uh, Business Analytics, is rebuilt from the ground up. Uh, students admitted will be starting uh, their journey here at HKU by taking some of the foundation courses, such as programming language, uh, database management, and statistics. And then starting from their junior or senior years, they are going to take courses from two lists based on their interest. List A are courses relating to the data the methodologies that we mentioned earlier, such as machine learning, uh, deep learning, uh, recommendation, natural language processing, clustering, and, and, and so on. And list B are basically courses relating to management applications, business applications. And these courses are uh, visualization of data, project management, uh, and so on. So basically, students can take based on their interest. So our hope is to basically train well-rounded data talents who can adapt in the business world. And then later on, they can basically uh, specialize in one or two domains uh, along the way. Okay, so, so basically, uh, for graduates, we expect you guys to get into a job related to information management, uh, business intelligence, uh, data consulting, and so on. So there are many uh, possibilities. So for me, uh, or for you guys, if, you have, if you're excited about solving problems and generating value through the lens of, uh, of data, and you aim to, to develop a career, in analytics, then BBA BA will be a perfect uh, program for you, for you. And later today at 4 p.m., I'm going to give a talk, uh, more detail of this program, uh, also online. So feel free to jump in our online conversation in, in about uh, two hours' time. So that's my introduction. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dora Deng. Uh, again, like because of the. Uh, uh, time limit, uh, I would refer you to visit our program virtual booth and also speak with Professor Light such as uh, Dr. Deng if you're interested in any of the, the program. And I'm, I'm grateful uh, for our guest like speaker today. Uh, I mean, we learned a lot. Uh, I mean, certainly great insight like provided to our potential student. And uh, I mean, if, if I'm light, uh, I mean, 30 years younger, I certainly will <laughs> jump into this like, industry that all we are talking about. Uh, it's definitely very exciting. Yeah, thank you so much. By Mr. Ying Choi, the Student Recruitment Counselor of the Admissions Office. So, um, Professor Yim, apart from your programs about big data, I also know that the university is actually offering two new programs, right? So do you want to talk about that also? Sure. Uh, yes, I think even though like, uh, we're all so excited about all this uh, data related, uh, I mean, the big data related program, but certainly uh, we're also introducing two new programs. And again, it's like, uh, just like those uh, big data programs, we develop them to meet the market need and also student need. So this new two new program, we are also like uh, having the same purpose. The first program is uh, the Bachelor of Psychology. Now, of course, like psychology is not like uh, I mean, kind of a very new discipline compared to maybe the, the new data science uh, principle that I mean, the discipline that we talked about earlier. Uh, the reason why we introduced this Bachelor of Psychology is because in the past, we have a lot of students telling us uh, when they are interested in psychology. They have to first like, select the, uh, the degree in social sciences, and then they get, after getting into the uh, faculty of social sciences, then they can select the psychology as major. And many of them said, like, I already know, I really want to go into psychology. So is that a way for me to directly enter a program that focuses on psychology? So, so basically, this program is designed to uh, kind of reply in response to, to uh, uh, what they request. Uh, of course, like, uh, other than just separating out psychology as a, a, a bachelor degree. 
we also try to enhance the overall like, offering of courses to psychology like, focused students. Uh, so for example, like, we will focus on enhancing the research capability of this student because uh, many of these students will not just uh, just stop the studying after the undergraduate degree. And many of them will go on to actually pursue higher degree. And so for, for those students, research become a very important part for them. Now other students may pursue a uh, career uh, after their graduation. So in this program, they also be providing, uh, providing enhanced uh, career planning, career guidance, so as to, to make sure the student can actually get a good start in, in uh, starting a career uh, in uh, field that are related to psychology. And I also like to mention, uh, in this Bachelor of Psychology, students can also do a second major uh, in related fields, such as uh, cognitive science, uh, neuroscience, con uh, counseling, or even uh, criminology. So, so that program is also like, uh, should be quite popular. Uh, another new program uh, is, is a double degree Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Law. So if you look at the title of the program, you can probably tell uh, it's an integrated program. Uh, it's a five-year program. Students have to spend uh, one extra year studying because of the uh, content is uh, much richer. And so they will be doing a lot of courses that integrate uh, understanding of science as well as like, understanding of uh, legal aspect. And as I mentioned, like, uh, we designed this program to also meet uh, the need of the, the market. And uh, so many of you probably uh, understand this day, many of the new startup company, they would develop new technology and they oftentimes have to apply for uh, patents. Or sometimes they have to also have to uh, get approval, uh, like medical uh, equipment or medical -like, uh, related uh, kind of product, they will have to get uh, approval from like FDA or maybe other, other related -like kind of authority. And so, so people can do this type of job, they not only need to have an understanding of the legal aspect, but they also need to understand something about science. So, Basically, this program is designed to help students who are interested in entering those careers uh, in order to, to definitely meet the, the challenge of the market in, in terms of uh, like, uh, approval, in terms of like, uh, patent application, or even in terms of like, uh, intellectual property protection, uh, which is a very uh, important field. Uh, so those are the two new programs. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Professor Yim. I think um, our students are now introduced to these two new programs, and um, it's really exciting. So um, meanwhile, I actually see that there are actually many questions in the Zoom chat and also in the webinar. So please keep sending uh, questions through the Q&A function at the webinar. So the, and the collected questions will be answered in the Q&A session later. So before we move on to Q&A session, I know that Ying and also Professor Yim would like to update us on a bit of the admission requirements, right? Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening through the session. I hope after you have heard all these exciting updates about these new programs, you are now eager to learn how you could be a part of the AKU undergraduate student population. So here, there are a few things that you should know. First and foremost, I would like to talk about the admissions pathway. If you are a student studying an international qualification, such as an IB diploma or the GCE A level, in the, or, or a regional or national qualification that we do recognize, um, you will be able to apply through the international slash non jupis admissions pathway, regardless of the passport you're holding. We are already accepting applications for the 2022 intake now, with a first round evaluation deadline of November 17, 2022 after which all applications will be considered on a rolling basis, subject to program availability. Because of that, we highly recommend students to apply early in order to secure an earlier offer with us. Next, we want to talk about the admissions requirements. Professor Yim, could you tell us a little bit more about what students should pay particular attention to when they're researching that uh, piece of information on the website? Well, of course, uh, the most important things uh, you should kind of pay attention to will be all the uh, admission -like requirement, right? Because uh, at Hong Kong, you are trying to make all these like, uh, requirements as transparent as possible. And all the requirements are listed on the website. And they're also set in such a way that if you meet all the requirements, we, we want to make sure like, uh, I mean, those students who enter in the program will be able to do really well in our program. And for instance, each year we'll publish uh, the expected uh, lower boundary 
So students can actually, based on those information, to have a very good uh, estimate of how likely or how competitive they will be for entry into a very specific program. And we update those information every year based on the previous year's uh, uh, result. Yeah. And in the same way, uh, regarding other requirements uh, such as English language requirement, because uh, you, all you probably know, uh, Hong Kong U is uh, using English as the only teaching medium. So for at least like uh, most of, almost all of our program. So having a good like, uh, level of English understanding is very important for your success in studying at Hong Kong U. And then uh, in, in addition, uh, basically half, close to half of our program do not have any program specific requirement. But the other half, if you happen to be selecting those programs, you want to also pay attention to whether those programs have more specific requirements. I'll give you an example. Some of them may have requirement on math and also like on English. Uh, and some programs, for example, those of uh, program in engineering, they may also have, uh, need a requirement on uh, science and science subject. Uh, so basically, uh, all, all these uh, admission requirements are set to make sure when we admit uh, you into one of our programs, you will be able to do well in the program. Thank you, Professor Yim. We have also included some examples of what those kind of uh, uh, requirements that we do recognize. So you can learn more about them by visiting our virtual booth or website later as well. Now, I've also listed some additional documents that students should provide. A point to note here uh, is that students can nominate referees to provide the reference letters, as well as nominate counselors to provide additional information, such as transcripts, predicted results, if your school follow uh, A, uh, A level or IB curriculum that offer uh, predicted grades for you. The referees will receive an email invitation directly to provide their confidential reference, where counselors would have a higher level of access. For example, they would be able to verify the academic achievements that you put in on your application form. We also encourage students to go back to the application form from time to time to update the results, to upload new piece of uh, documents uh, to facilitate our assessment of the student's application throughout the entire application cycle. Now, Professor Yim, I know that our applicants are actually very well-rounded, have, have participated probably in a wide range of extracurricular activities. Many of them may have joined international competitions, and perhaps some of them even have their own startups as well. How can students tell us more about these kind of uh, achievements? Yes, yes. Those information are actually very important because at, at HKU here, we adopt a holistic assessment of each student. So other than like, uh, all this uh, um, academic uh, kind of qualification, it's very important if you have any uh, achievement or any like participation in extracurricular activity, you certainly want to let us know. And if you note uh, on our uh, application website, there will be a session called extracurricular achievement. And so certainly like those are, that is the area that you can put down any of your achievement. And also don't forget about your personal statement. Uh, each of our uh, uh, admission tutor will actually go through your personal statement and to identify in what way are you making contribution in, in different ways. For example, like leadership, communication, uh, global mindedness, uh, or other services. So, so all this information, please make sure if you have any achievement, anything you want to tell us, make sure you put it either under the extracurricular uh, achievement uh, session or input them into your personal statement. Thank you very much, Professor Yim. Last but not least, students can select up to five program choices on the application form, and they will be considered for all five programs, up to all five programs independently at the same time. So students will be assessed based on their fit to these programs individually, and may also receive more than one offer based on their application and profile. Uh, do take note that some programs may prefer students to put them as a first choice. So when you do your research, we uh, recommend that you also check that information on our website as well. All right, so thank you, Professor Yim and also Ying. So next up is our Q&A session. So we've received many questions and we'll address them one by one. So um, in the meantime, uh, still feel free to send in the questions via the Q&A uh, function if you have any. So now I'll pass the time to Ying and Professor Yim. Thank you. Okay, I think we have quite a lot of questions coming in. And before we go into that, uh, that section, I just want to remind you that you can always refer to the screen uh, right now to, find, to download the latest copy of the International and non jupas Emissions Brochure, which have all the information, including the emission standards that we have already mentioned. 
Okay, so now uh, let's go through the questions. So a student want to know if the university is currently offering online classes. <laughs> Professor Yim, uh, yes. okay. would, you, would you please take that question? Sure, yeah, I, I think I'm very happy to uh, let everybody know that uh, the COVID situation in Hong Kong is uh, very much under control. We have, like, uh, for a long period of time, we have no cases, and even sometimes maybe only one, a few cases, like, usually, like, uh, imported cases. Uh, so within the city, uh, the situation is definitely within control. And so that's why, starting from uh, the beginning of this semester, the university have decided to resume all our in-person classes. So right now, like, we no longer need to rely on online classes, uh, which I think most of the students understand is not the best way to learn. So we expect like uh, all our activity are, are, are will be kind of basically back to normal uh, already. And I've been seeing a lot of students on campus joining different kind of activity. And even within the city, uh, you can see it's a vibrant city with everybody going to the mall on, on, on the weekend and participating in all kinds of activity, either outdoor or indoor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, we have another very eager question, uh, eager student asking a question about what they can do after they graduate. So um, what can students do with an HAU degree, Professor Yim? Well, uh, as a couple of the speakers just earlier mentioned, uh, as a Hong Kong U graduate, you can do anything you want. Uh, the sky is the limit. Uh, so as, as our speaker Brian mentioned, uh, almost 100% of our students, uh, even in the, this past year when we are hit by COVID and, and all this uh, problem, we have close to 100% employment. So if you graduate from Hong Kong, you like, uh, I mean, you shouldn't even need to worry about uh, kind of finding a job. Uh, I think, of course, uh, there will be many jobs waiting for you, and many of us students actually get multiple offer. Uh, the difficult thing is uh, they have to choose one that best fit their need. All right, let's move on to the next question. So there are actually, I think, a lot of questions uh, being asked on the admissions requirements to particular programs, particular majors. I think in particular related to the big data programs that we just talked about. So that piece of information is actually available on our admissions brochure that you can access via the, uh, via the QR code uh, on the screen or through our website. So as mentioned by Professor Yim, we also provide expected lower boundaries for students uh, so that you can use it as a reference to, to, to assess your com uh, how competitive you are for these programs, including the new programs that we have uh, just recently launched. Um, do I need to sit for any additional entrance exams or tests for admissions to HAU, Professor Yim? Would you? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we don't require students to sit for any other entrance exam for admission to HKU, and all the students will be uh, assessed primarily based on the international or national exams recognized by the university. So you, all you need to do is submit those information, and as I mentioned earlier, don't forget to include all your extracurricular uh, achievement and also any personal uh, kind of achievement that you want to communicate uh, to us. So yes, a very important point to note here that students should definitely include their profile, academic profile and other qualifications uh, as much as possible so that we can assess their suitability to the programs. Um, so students are also asking about other examinations such as IELTS, TOEFL uh, and other exams that we do recognize. So uh, just to mention kind of uh, 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 repeating what uh, we, we have already talked about, those exams are on the list on HAU, so for example TOEFL and IELTS, to fulfill HAU's English language requirements, uh, but they are not standalones for consideration of admissions. So students should check whether their credentials in itself already meet the English language requirements. So for example, IB students may already be able to use their IB English to meet the university's English language requirements. So you may not actually need to provide additional tests such as IELTS or TOEFL. So do make sure you go through our website again uh, and make sure you meet all the requirements and then you will be uh, very much ready to submit your application to us. So another question about Chinese. Um, Professor Yim, do students need to speak Chinese in order to get accepted? No, Hong Kong U is, uh, we use the, the medium of instruction in Hong Kong U is, is purely English. So Chinese is not required for our program. And that's like you're studying in, uh, really coming in to study Chinese. And I suppose like uh, some of your classes may be conducted in Chinese. But other than that, uh, you don't need to know Chinese to enter Hong Kong U. And in fact, like uh, close to two thirds of our professorial staff 
at Hong Kong Yacht International. So it, it can tell you, like, uh, I mean, this is not a local or Chinese university. This is actually an international university. Yes, uh, just one note to, to add. Uh, sometimes the Chinese requirements may be in place for particular programs if there is a need for you to communicate that to uh, the, your clients or patients, for example, in the healthcare industry. So there may be additional requirements, but all such information is already published on the website. And as Professor Yim mentioned, all programs actually you will be taught in English. Okay, so a follow-up question on also the second language requirements. Um, so some students wonder how they can meet that requirements if they already speak the language but not necessarily have taken any examinations. So it's actually very simple. There are a number of ways you can meet the second language requirements as listed on a website again. So you want to take note of that. And on top of it, if none of your current qualifications meet the second language requirements, you can also consider uh, submitting a waiver application for second language. So the detailed information is also available on the website. Okay, so uh, there are a couple more technical questions. So first we have a question on personal statement. How long should my personal statement be? Uh, how many may I submit? So as most of you know, the personal statement is required for students who want to be considered for HAU. Uh, and when we talk about the length, uh, general length of the personal statement, one to two page, and uh, you can only submit one personal statement for your entire application. So even if you're applying to five programs, you will only be allowed to submit one personal statement. So do choose to consider what you want to include in the person, personal statement very carefully, as that will be read by all the programs. Uh, Ying, actually, I would like to also supplement on the personal statement. Uh, yes. it's, it's the quality, not the quantity that count. And also keep uh, remembering, we would like to know your achievement rather than just simply what have you done. So, so maybe, uh, I mean, you should keep that in mind when preparing your personal statement. Thank you for your advice, Professor Yim. So when should I submit my application? Okay, so we mentioned that our application has already opened for 2022 Intech. So if you are a final year student, so a student who is expected to enter university in September or in the fall of 2022, now is a great time for you to submit the application. We only have one uh, intake, uh, which is every September. So if you are uh, eager, if you want to con be considered for HAU, but perhaps you may not have all the final results at this stage yet. For example, your IB students were going to take your IB exams. Uh, in, in May next year, then you can submit uh, your application along with the predicted or anticipated or expected results through the application system, either uh, through your counselors or through your school. And once you have your final results, then you can update that uh, directly on the application form. So once students receive an admissions offer, they will also be given approximately four to six weeks to respond to those offers. Okay, so uh, a question on interviews. So, so I think that's a, a, a very interesting question because all students want to know how else the application will be assessed. So for some programs, uh, interviews will be part of the consideration. Most of our interviews will start uh, in December, as, er as early as December. So um, that's another reason why if you're very keen to be considered for HAU, uh, you should uh, submit your application by mid-November, November 17th to be exact, uh, this year. For overseas applicants, we also will arrange uh, online interviews if necessary. So please uh, do stay tuned. Uh, another question about the program choice. Um, we have, uh, I, I briefly touched upon that on my slides. So how important are the program choice? In, in particular, I think the placement of the program choice, which I think is, is, is a big deal because students are in fact submitting five, uh, uh, up to five program choices. Uh, uh, and, and they will be considered for the, at the same time as well. So in terms of how uh, the, the, the program uh, choice order or the priority goes. Students will have one first choice programs and all the other four programs will be listed at, as the same. So you have one first choice programs and all other four, uh, up to four other choices programs. And some uh, programs, for example, are very competitive programs like, the, like medicine, for example, will give preference uh, to students who put uh, their program as the first choice. And program will only know whether you place them as a first choice or not. So do uh, take that into consideration as you are strategizing that part of your application. 
Okay, um, I think uh, we are coming pretty close to the end, so I will probably take one last question. Is it okay for me to apply uh, for a gap year? Uh, so yes, you can let us know uh, you have graduated and provide your firm results upon your application. So uh, we one one point I kind of wanna wanna highlight, make note that uh, you wanna. Uh, also includes, so for example, if you're already taken a gap year, now you're applying to HAU after the, uh, after the gap, gap year, do make sure that you, you include information about what you've done during the last year, include any of the final results that you have already uh, achieved, and that uh, piece of information will also be quite important in the uh, evaluation process as well. So I think that's it. Um, um, we have gone through quite a lot of questions, and we see that there are many eager students who are uh, interested to join the HAU in the upcoming fall. So I want to take this chance to thank everyone for joining. We will be sending a list of frequently asked questions to registrants, so please uh, do stay tuned to that piece of information. And thank you very much. Thank you.